Yeah, so the German Revolution of November 1918, it had an immense colossal impact on the course of international events. It meant like the end of the First World War. And of course, uh, the Russian working class was looking at it with, you know, with startling inspiration to break their isolation, right, from, from the Russian Revolution. Um, and of course, a successful German Revolution can aid them economically, right? And, and of course, spread the socialist revolution further to the West. So mass demonstrations broke out in celebration of hearing this excellent news of, uh, of Germany in, in Russia. And uh, it would have also meant the biggest blow to, to world capitalism since the Russian Revolution itself. So the ruling class was terrified at hearing about this event. They were terrified of, of Bolshevism. And the uh, British Prime Minister Lloyd George, he basically summed up the entire uh, you know, situation when he said that the whole of Europe was, uh, was filled with the spirit of revolution. Now, Germany was a key country, right? It was at the center of Europe. It was the most industrialized country um, in, in Europe, you know, opposed to Russia, when, of course, the revolution broke out in Russia. It was a very backward country. Um, and it would have meant, like, a successful revolution would have meant the end of, of capitalism. You know, the whole of Europe would have gone communist. Uh, and that was not only the feelings of the capitalists, as I said, who were very worried, but also Lenin himself, who said that he was prepared to give up the Russian revolution a Russian revolution for one in Germany. Um, and the working class also had a very strong Marxist traditions, right? Uh, stretching back all the way to Marx and Engels. And the German workers' movement uh, had been also at the center of the Second International in the pre-war period. So there was enormous potential. And it would have changed, as I said, like the entire course of history. There would also have meant like no Second World War, no Holocaust. Um, and uh, it, uh, basically all those strategies would have been absent had the working class been victorious. And in fact, you know, in, in Germany, power was at the hands of the workers, of the sailors, of the soldiers. Uh, but tragically, however, the German proletariat failed to actually see this opportunity um, and, and to actually create a German socialist republic, which would, of course, set alight the whole of Europe. So very rapidly, the workers, you know, who, who actually had power in their hands through their councils that, that basically sprung up, um, uh, they basically just handed power over to the social democratic leaders, which they in turn uh, just disbanded the workers' uh, councils that were set up and murdered the best of the workers' leaders and uh, rescued German capitalism. And over the five years of the revolution, um, basically just continues, all sorts of struggles were taken taking place, but then finally the defeat of 1923 meant the nail in the coffin for the immediate prospect of, of a world socialist revolution. Um, and of course also consolidated Stalin's control over the Comintern. So Germany had been the cradle of, of Marxism. Both Marx and Engels spent a great amount of time in educating and building up this, this German uh, labor movement. And the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD, ever since its foundations, basically uh, gave uh, allegiance you know, to Marxism and was seen as the embodiment of, uh, of German revolutionary tradition. Uh, and it was the biggest party, and it was a Marxist party, you know, the biggest party in the world before the war. Um, and with the huge apparatus, as you heard like yesterday, it had big support in the working class. It even set up trade unions uh, itself. Um, and had, yeah, a, a third of the working class vote in, in uh, 1912, which is about 4.2 million people have voted for, for the SPD. They had 90 daily newspapers. So huge apparatus and huge authority within the working class. And in words, they were talking about Marxism. They were talking about Marxist ideas. Um, and therefore, all eyes were on Germany, that if there was going to be, you know, a revolution, then surely in Germany it would be successful. Surely, you know, Germany was the, the country where, where uh, you know, it would happen. Um, however, what's important to realize is that this party, the SPD, grew up um, in a period of economic upswing in, in capitalism. There was a boom and it, so, it was basically uh, sowing illusions in capitalism that basically through a gradual strengthening of the working classes organizations that also we can then improve the working classes conditions. So basically find a very peaceful, you know, road into, into socialism. Um, and that has caused, you know, 
the degeneration in particular of the SPD leadership who were very detached and from, from the actual situation on the ground. Uh, and they limited themselves, therefore, instead of actually fighting for revolution, just limited themselves to fighting for reforms. Um, and, and basically revolution in, in words, but, you know, their day to day deeds were reformist. Um, and of course, you know, as Marxists, we're not opposed to fighting for reforms. Obviously, we, we do that. But we also, also say that how important it is to raise the consciousness, right? And link our fight for reforms to a fight for socialism, link it to a revolutionary program. Uh, and that's exactly what the SPD leaders were deserting away from. So this resulted in, in very sharp and theoretical debates within the SPD. Now Bernstein was one of those, uh, you know, leaders who was basically on the reformist wing, uh, of the party and was coming out with these revisionist ideas. And then opposed to him was Rosa Luxemburg, right? On the left hand side of the party and was having these sharp debates against the, you know, the, the degeneration that she was witnessing. And out of this polemic, uh, you know, her famous work, Reform or Revolution, uh, basically brought about. Um, but however, Kautsky, who was, you know, the main leader of the SPD, huge authority, and was actually like, you know, trained even by Engels himself, uh, had like real connections with, with Marx and Engels. He himself was more concerned about, you know, keeping unity within the party. He was just turning a blind eye to all of these issues and, uh, and basically just paid lip service, you know, to, to the revolution. Now, what brought this degeneration all out in the open was, uh, was, you know, with, in August 1914, when the First World War broke out. And the SPD, le uh, SPD leadership, instead of actually explaining, you know, the real cause of, of the war, you know, explaining the imperialist interests that are at stake here, they just spoke about defending the fatherland and actually saying that that is an, a, a true, like, internationalist position, trying to, of course, find excuses. But they were social, uh, social sovereignists, right? Um, and in the German par parliament, the Reichstag, they all voted in favor for the war credit. And so only Karl Liebknecht, who was also on the left with, with Rosa Luxemburg, who voted against the war credits. So it was one person against the 110 who voted together, you know, for the, for the war. Um, and he was basically now turned into, you know, this, this anti-war hero, this true revolutionary uh, internationalist and had huge, you know, uh, a good basically representation, like in, in internationally, not just in Germany. Um, but it was not only in Germany, um, well, sorry, but it was also like in practice, right? What this actually meant, this vote, was that these so-called Marxists of the SPD basically voted in favor for sending millions of workers to go out and, and kill each other, which also proves right, you know, that Rosa Luxemburg was right to call out on this opportunism of the SPD. But also that Bernstein's theory of a, like a peaceful road to socialism was proven immediately false and incorrect. Workers' rights was taken away like that overnight. And this whole, uh, you know, question that was posed by Rosa Luxemburg, either we fight for socialism or we end up in barbarism, is exactly what, you know, what was proven correct and what they were faced with. And this betrayal of the German SPD, you know, as, as we said yesterday, dealt a crushing blow to the international. It was such a huge, you know, surprise, even as we said to Lenin, who, you know, well, the authority of the SPD leadership was so high that he, yeah, thought that it was a forgery by the German general staff. He couldn't believe this, this newspaper forwards of the, of the SPD uh, and thought that, yeah, it was just false. But internationally, therefore, um, the only true, like, <coughs> Marxists and internationalists were reduced to only a handful full of people who actually stood, you know, firmly for the principles of Marxism. And so it was only Lenin, Luxembourg, uh, um, Liebknecht, Colony, and John McLean. And of course, you had the, you know, the Serbian party, for example, who also voted against the war credit. And so at the, at the Congress in Zimmerwald, Lenin kind of joked that all of the internationalists could fit in only two stage coaches by then. So that was the, that was the stage, you know, of the second international. And Rosa Luxemburg actually described it as a stinking corpse. It was just dead, basically. And it meant, it meant the end of, of the second international. It completely collapsed. But out of this, Luxembourg and Marin and Liebknecht, they, they, you know, a tendency was formed around them after this betrayal, right? And uh, it became known as the Internationale Group. Um, and it was basically this nucleus around which later on the, co the, the Communist Party was to crystallize. 
Um, but on New Year's Day in, uh, in 1916, thank you, uh, at Rosa Luxemburg's instance, they took the decision to launch a journal called the Spartacus, you know, and so the, the Spartacus League was basically formed. Now, by 1917, the war of weariness, of course, engulfed the masses of, of, uh, of the workers in, you know, everywhere, but also, of course, in Germany. Um, and the soldiers at the front were, of course, also sickened by the war. So mass strikes broke out against the war and real ferment was growing, not just amongst the working class, but also within the party itself, within the SPD. Um, and, and this ferment was reflected within the party when a split was taking place. You know, you had, of course, the, yeah, the, the right wing, I guess, that stayed, you know, with the SPD and a more left wing, uh, you know, split was, was, uh, taking place that was called the independence, the U, the USPD, uh, which took about 120,000 members of the SPD with them. So it was basically quite, a, quite a significant split. But this also makes it a very important political point because the fact is that Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht up until the war broke out never actually built a really well organized, you know, political homogenous faction within the SPD. Um, and to train up those cadres, right? Basically how Lenin and the Bolsheviks had done uh, within the, um, uh, what's it called, the, the RSDLP, so the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. Because if they did, right, if they had like strong cadres uh, in the party within the SPD sooner, rather than this loose network that then existed, then obviously by the time that the war broke out, they could have led this split, right? They could have taken these people with them and actually provided, you know, a, a revolutionary alternative for them to join. Um, and they, yeah, it created basically a revolutionary organization that would arise out of this anger, right? And uh, arise out of this great betrayal. And they could have answered this. They could have provided that leadership and not let these reformists basically lead the split in the USBD. Um, but it was simply too late. Like the building such a cater organization cannot be done spontaneously, as we know. Um, and therefore they lost a great opportunity to, to win over the masses, basically. Now, the split of the SPD also took place when the excellent news of the February Revolution, uh, you know, came out uh, and reached Germany, and it had an electrifying effect um, on, on these conditions. The German working class rose up even further, um, again, like moved into mass strikes against the war. And the old regime felt its ground moving under its feet. And in October 1918, rumors started to spread that this naval battle that, you know, they were, um, basically the German high command was, was uh, decided on, um, was simply basically a gamble to risk 80,000 people's lives for just to save the honor of the German Navy. Now that was like the, the spark, basically. That was the straw and sparked resistance, um, that began the revolution itself. And so on November the 3rd, a mutiny took place in one ship in Kiel and spread all over the North Sea with 100,000 sailors taking uh, part in this mutiny. And it was also unprecedented because one town after another, you know, like workers started setting up workers' councils in solidarity with, with the sailors. Even, the, of course, the mood was also within the army. So the army set up their own councils as well. So it was, uh, it was enormous, like it spread like wildfire, basically. And uh, it was basically, you know, those councils are, you know, essentially the same as the Soviets that we've seen in Russia from 1905 and again in 1917. So they were organs of power. And war is often, you know, said, rightly said, like war is often the midwife of, of revolution. And that was the case in Russia. And it was also the case here in Germany. And uh, the chancellor uh, is Prince von Baden. <coughs> he basically realized that the game was up. <laughs> he, he's, he just saw no other way than to ask for the Kaiser to abdicate. He's like, we have to give the masses something here. Uh, and of course, the Kaiser didn't want to abdicate. Uh, on the contrary, his advice was to, you know, he said, well, take your most loyal troops, go out with bombs and fire throwers and just crush this revolution, just bring it down. Um, but the answer to, to the Kaiser was, Sire, you have no army. It's all—it's all gone. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and he stubbornly refused to believe this. He was like, no, no, you have to put it down. You have to. He, he just was so out of touch, like actually the Tsar in 1917, so out of touch with what was happening on the ground. Um, and so it was this quite like this funny episode where he learned about his abdication from the chancellor himself. So he heard it second hand. And, uh, and he basically had just took the train the next day to the Netherlands and stayed the rest of his life there uh, in exile and the whole monarchy just uh, disintegrated. So with no army and no police and the masses on the move, the ruling class, you know, the final sort of option that they had was to look towards the workers' leaders themselves and uh, to basically defuse the situation to save them. <laughs> And in other words, they looked at this new breed of careerists that floated to the top within the SPD. Uh, and these big leaders were Abbott, Noske, and Scheidemann. Now, these leaders did not want a revolution. Um, they were very much opposed to the revolution. So they were asked basically to come into this government uh, to, you know, stop this revolutionary wave of what was happening. And uh, in fact, you know, Abbott very famously said his famous quote was, I hate revolution like sin. He was completely opposed uh, to, to, he detested it, basically, he was terrified of this whole situation. And he was a liberal democrat, all he wanted was to be in opposition in a germ, I mean, in a bourgeois-like democracy and, uh, and not deal with all this mess. But the mass of, uh, of workers in moving a revolution in 1918, well, well, who do they look to, right? They didn't look to Luxembourg and Liebknecht, who were very small, right, a small organization. They looked at the SPD, this party that they have built for decades, right, with a huge apparatus and huge prestige. So um, it was very like, you know, normal that, you know, all of the, you know, direction was basically in, in their hands. So shortly after this news of the abdication of the Kaiser, Scheidemann was in the Reichstag, he was just eating his soup, when he heard like these masses arriving to the Reichstag, just shouting, wanting to, you know, hear from the leaders what needed to be done now, the Kaiser is gone, what's the next step, just, you know, tell us. And they were of course screaming their socialist demands. And uh, he's just kind of like being swept away by the mood, not really knowing like, you know, what to do. So he just went onto the balcony and kind of spontaneously announced that Abbott was now the chancellor. And almost like as an afterthought, he said, oh, and long live the German Republic. Now, this was, <laughs> this was a huge, you know, blow because as soon as Abbott heard this news, who is, by the way, just a, support, a supportive, like, you know, very much in favor of the monarchy, but uh, basically, he was absolutely enraged and his face turned livid. He banged with his fist on the table. He was furious at Scheidemann's like presumption. He said, you have no right to proclaim a republic. You cannot do that. But it was simply too late. It had been done. And so the SPD leadership's like first act as, as chancellor was to ask this Prince von Baden to just accept the regent's office, hoping to restore a constitutional monarchy but Prince von Baden realized, he was like, no, th this is not what the masses want. This is not like gonna, gonna work. So he said, you know what? We, we I basically, I will give up my power. I will give up this government uh, and handed it over on the 9th of November to Ebert, Noske and Scheidemann to the, to the SPD and said, well, you should take it. You take the reins of the government and you smash this revolution. You bring it down. And, uh, and so basically they did. And that's, and this is again a very important point because it's often the case that the role of, of like the, the reformist leaders of workers organizations is to hold the masses back, right? <laughs> they, they are always the last line of defense, uh, for the capitalists to, to, you know, to rely on, to, to hold the masses back, send them home and say, this is how we do it in a civilized way. You can have what you want. Just go home, basically. So you have the situation here, right? Where the working class had power in their hands, you know, through the councils that they set up everywhere. Uh, and therefore the, you also had, you know, uh, the, the army coming from war so they were armed <laughs> and you had these armed massive demonstrations uh, taking place all over the cities, even in Berlin. And the old government was suspended in midair. But of course, again, who do, who do they then rely on? It's, it's those leaders, it's those SPD leaders. So the, the working class had power in its hand, but was simply not conscious of that fact. They, did, they didn't realize this. 
And now this in itself is a very normal stage, right, of, of consciousness and how it develops. Uh, because, you know, what communists need to do, you know, as Lenin said, was to patiently explain our revolutionary program, to, you know, be with them and, and, and put our case forward. Um, and thus, this is exactly the sort of like, you know, the, the methods that they applied when the Mensheviks won, right, in February, and where the workers were also not conscious of their powers. So they had to put this slogan of all power to the Soviets and trying to explain, you know, in this period up until October, when finally the workers actually seized power. This is what needed to be done. But this leadership was simply absent in Germany. It wasn't, it wasn't being uh, um, done and prepared for. So events moved on quickly. And on the 10th of November, at a meeting of the of the Berlin Workers uh, Workers and Soldiers Council, they basically officially proclaimed, you know, itself to be the representative of, of the revolutionary people, and so they took this decision to set up a council of people's commissars under the control of the executive council. So this term commissar was obviously like, um, you know, an attempt by the social democrats as well to steal a little bit of this enormous prestige of the Russian revolution, you know, showing how much they were prepared to go in words, but actually not in deeds to ful fulfill, you know, the and to sort of complete the, the revolution. Now, the aim of Abbott, Scheidemann, you know, and the other social democratic leaders was to re-establish their authority, right, uh, of, the, of the capitalist states, you know, as quickly as possible. And so the immediate threat of, of the revolution, when it began to subside, the German bourgeois put their full weight behind, you know, this call for a constituent assembly as a means of undermining the workers' councils. Um, and so the same bourgeois who yesterday had solidly, you know, supported the autocracy now came forward as Democrats. So first they were monarchists and now they were, you know, proud Republicans. Um, and so they gave up, they, I'm sorry, they gave the workers basically the right to vote. They gave the workers, you know, all sorts of democratic rights, the right to strike. Uh, they even granted them an eight hour day, even though the capitalists couldn't afford it. But it shows like the point is the ruling class was prepared to give up everything, to give them all of these concessions in order to just say to them, well, you know, anything basically to save their system, right? And they wanted to attach this very clear condition to it. Yeah, yeah, you can have all of those, you know, concessions and these rights, just go home, you know, stop here and go home. And so the question of the National Assembly was therefore a bit of a controversial one, um, because here the Spartacist group, who was very new, very inexperienced, and say politically in inexperienced as well, um, they, they didn't really, they basically took the wrong position because Luxembourg and Liebknecht recognized that the majority of the workers were in favor, very much in favor of the National Assembly. Most workers saw a parliamentary like democracy at least as a step forward from the monarchy that they had in the past. Um, and so they, they basically, well, Luxembourg therefore said, well, we as communists, we should take, you know, part in this uh, constituted assembly and use it as a platform to put forward our program, our revolutionary demands, um, and of course, expose the whole capitalist regime. But the party youth were decidedly against it. They basically saw the National Assembly as just another parliament, as just another reformist thing uh, that they didn't want to take part in because they were so inferior to the workers' councils, which is obviously correct. Of course, it's inferior to it, but it wasn't enough to just denounce, you know, the, the, the National Assembly and reject it and just to call for a revolution. They ignored that under the conditions, you know, prevailing in Germany in 1918, where the working class had not yet taken power, it was necessary to march shoulder to shoulder, you know, with the workers, with the masses, participate in their elections and offering a revolutionary program, um, you know, of action. And this is exactly what Lenin was trying to emphasize and argue for in his work, Left Wing Communism, you know, in Infantile Disorder, against these ultra left tendencies. But now once the assembly was set up and all of these concessions were granted to the workers, the SPD leaders made this case, well, forget then about the councils, let's just dissolve them, let's have this national assembly or this um, yeah, national government, have your democratic elections, because this is basically what we want. And this is also what grants you reforms, right? It's through these councils, I mean, through this government, so you don't need the councils, let's just dissolve them. And that's basically what happened. And this ended the, the first phase of, of the revolution. So 
After the November Revolution, the ruling class was looking, you know, to strike a counter-revolutionary wave and a counter-revolutionary blow, basically, against the revolution. And so the German high command, led by Ebert, uh, made plans to occupy Berlin with a number of loyal troops to establish a reliable and a firm government, because Berlin was particularly the center of extreme turbulence, extreme instability. And there were continual strikes and mass demonstrations. So as far as Ebert was concerned, this was not like the center of the government, but it was the center of anarchy. It was just complete, uh, yeah, a, a mess, basically. So they wanted to, you know, establish law and order. So the SPD leaders were leaning more and more towards all these reactionary, you know, troops and these reactionary groups. One of which, such, you know, one of the, the famous one is the Freikorps, right? Um, who uh, were this ultra reactionary gangs, um, often officers drawn from this pro monarchist uh, military and sons of aristocracy and, and, you know, stuff like that. So they were determined to put a block onto the, onto the revolution. And even if that meant bloodshed. Um, so one of the ministers, Noska, uh, who became the Minister of Defense, he said that he was prepared to be the bloodhound of revolution. It's exactly his quote. So he just wanted to, to yeah, do whatever it takes, even if it meant, you know, killing these revolutionaries. So towards the end of December 1918, an alliance of the monarchists and the counter-revolutionary elements of uh, various, you know, descriptions all came together and basically started this, this vicious witch hunt against the Spartacist League in particular, who were, of course, the representatives of German Bolshevism. And an organization also called the Anti-Bolshevik League uh, was set up, which was financed by the government money and, and also plastered walls, you know, with posters in towns and villages, you know, uh, basically slandering the, the Spartacist leadership. And now just to like take a step back here because, and, and to realize, you know, the Bolshevik faction, so in Russia, formed 15 years before the actual, you know, Russian revolution took place. But in Germany, you had the first phase of the revolution, which was over. The counter revolution was trying to, you know, raise its head now. And it's only now that the communist party was, was set up and, and formed as an actual tight organization. So in late December 1918, under the influence of the October Revolution in Russia, pressure mounted within the, the Spartacist League to transform itself from this very like loose-knit organization to an actually tight, you know, centralized organization. And so the Communist Party or, or the KPD was basically formed uh, in Russia along the lines of the Bolsheviks. So within a few weeks, this small, very inexperienced party had to face up monumental challenges uh, because in Berlin in early December, uh, sorry, in early January, there existed an acute crisis in, in the government. A few USPD ministers had resigned as they did not agree with the government's actions and fears of rumors started to spread about a possibility of a coup. Um, and at the same time, a campaign of denigration was carried out against uh, Emil Eichhorn, who was a left-wing policeman uh, or police president, I would say, of, of Berlin, because he was regarded as a threat because uh, he organized a new left-wing police force of 2,000 uh, armed workers who were basically, you know, ready to defend the revolution. So to reassert the authority of the capitalist state, the Social Democrats wanted to remove him, but of course he, he refused to go. And this kind of, you know, started to spark this, uh, this, uh, this mass protest that was coming up. And it was called for by uh, the Berlin Executive Committee on the 5th of January in order to defend, you know, the gains of the revolution. And to the shock of everyone, including the communists, half a million people came out, you know, onto, onto the streets uh, to, to, to show their loyalty to the revolution and against the government and so on. And spontaneously, a revolutionary committee was formed and they had this idea, well, let's just get rid of this government. Let's just like overthrow this government and let's do this now. So... Of course, how this committee was not providing the, the correct leadership, right? They didn't really know what to do. And, uh, and it failed to give a coherent direction, you know, to the, to the mass movement, uh, which eventually then began to dissipate. 
And so the masses, after all, could not be, you know, kept in a permanent state of readiness. Um, so they had to, you know, the, the, this is basically the tricky part, right? Because they needed firm leadership at this time. And, you know, when they're trying, as, as Mark said, right, like, an insurrection is an art. It cannot be something that you play with. And they were kind of playing with it. And this is how, this is where things ended up badly because the government saw this like this organization. They saw, you know, how the masses were kind of like not sure what to do and they kind of dissipating. They saw a sign of weakness there and they started to step in using military means. Um, and of course the Freikorps element were called out as well to smash the workers and to try to drive out the workers. And so as as far as the counter-revolution was concerned, there was going to be no negotiations. It was a horrific bloodbath and 300 of these workers were just put against the wall and shot on the spot. And this uh, basically marked, you know, the, the end of the, oh yeah, of the Spartacist uprising. But it's clear that this so-called Spartacist uprising or Spartacist rebellion wasn't like a conscious strategy pursued by the Spartacist. This offense started by the government provocation and intended as a pretext to crush the movement. But it's not just that, the Spartacists struggled as well to hold you know, the, the workers back because anger was so high in Berlin uh, and the working class. And in January, it just simply reached a boiling point. But this makes an important point, right? Because again, the Communist Party was too small. It was too inexperienced. It didn't have, you know, decaders. So they couldn't give this insurrection and in actually an organized form. Uh, and also, or basically to hold the masses back when was needed, right? From a premature uprising um, that would basically end up in repression which it did. And again, underlines the need to build this revolutionary leadership like the Bolsheviks had done. But the damage has been done and the SPD used this rising as an excuse to hunt down on Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg as the main leaders of, of, you know, of, the, of Bolshevism basically in Germany and killed them. And this is the true vengeance you know, of the ruling class. They saw Liebknecht and they saw Luxembourg at the head of the revolution. And the only way that they could destroy the revolution was to destroy them physically. Um, and, and that's why they, uh, that's basically what they did. And that was the greatest strategy, you know, that befell the German revolution. Because these were the leaders, they had the authority. They could have led this communist party, you know, in the right direction. Because Rosa Luxemburg, you know, just before basically she was killed, she was realizing more and more the need to have a centralized, you know, organization and a cadre built organization. Um, but again, because there was no such, you know, cadre base, um, an organization at the time when Rosa Luxemburg was killed, it also meant that no one was ready to step up, you know, and play this role. There was a lack, it was a real lack. Of, of leadership um, and that was the inexperience you know of the party that would also lead to future catastrophic um, mistakes and the revolution is not just one act right revolution has many acts and in fact revolution and counter-revolution can come very close together and as Marx often you know remarked that the whip of counter-revolution can also push the revolution forward and that's exactly what happened because um, um, but because like um, you know this um, this whole you know counter-revolutionary wave that was taking place in Germany also meant that you know the USPD was getting you know more and more members towards them because workers wanted to organize themselves to fight against this counter-revolution and so they had explosive growth from about 300,000 members to 750,000. And their program also moved more and more towards uh, the Bolshevik and German uh, communist uh, party. And this also led to this very significant historic decision to leave the Second International to um, basically accept its 21 conditions of the, of the Third International and to create the largest communist party in the world outside of Russia and basically joined the, the Third International. So it seemed like the basis was now set, you know, for, for a successful socialist revolution in, in Germany. But the social, you know, Democrats who had saved the capitalist system from the immediate danger, uh, the capitalist class basically did not want to stop there. They said, okay, well, you had your job, you had your job done, so well done, but now we have to, you know, 
let you go and we want to re-establish real authority of a like the strong man government uh, and to to install a military dictatorship basically and so in march 1920 they staged a coup where they wanted to bring in this man called cap who was the national uh, civil servant to take the lead and you know famously this event got to of course got to be known as the capuch um, and so they were told, okay, the social democrats, you have to disarm, you have to go. Of course, they refused. And so the social democrats called on the armed forces to come out and defend them. But the, the armed forces refused because they basically became part of this anti-Bolshevik league. So the trade unionists, and of course, under the, under the call of the social democrats, were now forced to rely on the workers to try to hold this coup back. So for 20 years, they ridiculed the idea of calling for a general strike. And now they had to <laughs> because otherwise they would be arrested. So it was actually like to, to save their own, um, yeah, save their own, uh, you know, uh, prestige sort of thing. So they called on uh, the workers to come out. And to their surprise, this general strike was solid. Uh, masses of workers, the biggest movement of the working class since the revolution just came out. It paralyzed the whole of Berlin, paralyzed cities everywhere. And Cap was supposed to be the imposed prime minister. And he couldn't even find his stenographer you know, to write down the instructions because everyone was on strike. Um, however, the leaders of the Communist Party were of course still ultra left they still had the wrong you know political stance and so their initial response to this event was oh well the workers should actually remain neutral in the, in the struggle because this is between two you know reactionary camps fighting over this not realizing you know what what the workers like you know general strike what sort of impact that had so when it did when the general strike turned out to be solid and so successful they had to turn a 180 and say oh actually well, we are in support now of the general strike but this ultra left infantile stance only again served to isolate the party, right? From winning over the masses because these huge blunders, again, you miss opportunity to connect, you know, to, to the mood of the masses. So this whole series of battles that took place in Germany eventually all culminated basically to the crisis in 1923 which was the revolutionary situation with the occupation of the Ruhr uh, by the French army because of the failure of the Germans to pay the reparations for the First World War, which resulted in crazy like hyperinflation. Um, for example, like a statistic that comes to mind, um, it's like the price of one egg in, in 1923. So if, I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to have a guess, you can leave it there. But if anyone wants to say a number, you can. But guess like how many eggs you could buy in 1918 with the price of 1923, like an egg of 1923. Does anyone want to have a guess? Five million. A billion. <laughs> You were close. Oh, it's, it's 500 million. 500 million eggs you could buy in 1918 for the price yeah, of 1923. So this is the crazy hyperinflation that we're talking about. Money was completely devalued. Um, in fact, like the middle class was collapsing. People were going into rubbish bins to find food. And wages had to be spent the exact same day that you received them. If you waited until the next day, they were worthless. So it was this crazy, crazy situation and then was completely bankruptcy. And that sparked, of course, a spontaneous movement. Uh, but this time, unlike the Spartacists, which were only like a handful of people in Berlin, you had now this mass communist party, right? You know, from the, from the USPD who, who joined the Third International. So you had, uh, had huge potential. But again, what was, again, you know, under the wrong leadership, the communist party basically was too hesitant thinking that this was not actually a revolution that, you know, taking place. So again, they dismissed the opportunity they had at hand. And to be fair, this was all because of the wrong advice by Zinoviev and Stalin, who then were, of course, in the control of the Comintern. And they told them to go easy and, in fact, not to provoke the situation and let the fascists move first. So all they do was, you know, defend themselves and have, a, you know, the right to defend themselves sort of thing. It was, of course, completely the wrong advice. And that's what happened in 1923. So again, a huge strategy because all of these defeats were demoralizing, you know, to the working class in Germany and prepared the ground, you know, for moving more and more towards reaction at a later date. So what this whole experience shows in Germany from, you know, 1918 all the way till 1923 
is that like all of these like you know young and you know communist party that was not prepared for you know the tasks at hand were very inexperienced trying to learn in the middle of a revolution making mistakes making ultra left mistakes with you know the capuch and and stuff but then also in the other direction being too cautious in 1923 but whilst in 1919, the Communist International, under the leadership of Lenin and Trotsky, were patiently assisting the young parties, right, trying to draw the political conclusions and absorb the lessons of Bolshevism, by 1923, you know, the leadership of Stalin and Zinoviev was, you know, reflecting deep conservatism um, of, um, you know, of the Russian bureaucracy. And this defeat was one of the first key debates between Trotsky and, and Zinoviev and Stalin. And Trotsky, of course, wanted to learn the lessons. He wanted to, you know, uh, try to, you know, see what, what exactly what information he had at hand to try to draw the political conclusions. But he couldn't because he was isolated from information as Zinoviev and Stalin wanted to protect their prestige and sweep away their own responsibility for the defeat. So Germany was, you know, was full of strategies. But what it all boils down to, what the whole point is, is the lack of leadership, right? Which is the key ingredient for a success of a revolution. And it's our task and it's part of our heritage. And we have the responsibility to learn and to understand what happened in Germany to prepare ourselves, right? For what's the events that are coming in Britain, in Europe and in the rest of the world in this upcoming period. Because more and more and more people are clearly looking towards joining us now as communists, right? And well, if we are truly communists, if we can say, or, or if we are worthy of calling ourselves communists, then we need to prepare ourselves for what's coming. And, and what we see now is like, you know, there is no good in trying to create a revolutionary party on the spot, spontaneously in the middle of these hectic and turbulent events, but to create it in advance. And you have to create cadres, you have to create network and you have to create you know the embryo of a future party and this and it's events you know that affects the minds of the masses right that will transform the situation and prepare the ground for you know building a mass party in itself and this is also why we treat theory so seriously right because marxism can be defined you know as the historical experience of the working class since we are the memory of of all everything that has happened everything that the working class had to go through as opposed of course to the reformists who have no memory at all and, uh, and now, of course, Germany was a key country, but now there are many keys. Now there are many countries that have, can form this, this, you know, this, this center of, of the revolution. Uh, so there's huge potential. And one successful revolution, therefore, in one country can spark and you know, set alight the whole of Europe and therefore the whole of the world. And so the working class is now bigger and stronger than ever. But all it cries out for is leadership, right? A Marxist leadership, the correct leadership, and that's and prepared to go all the way. And that is our task, and that's what we will fight for. And indeed, as Rosa Luxemburg said, we are faced with this question of either to fight for socialism or barbarism, because of course it's barbarism and the capitalism, right? <laughs> and workers and young people and the youth are looking for an alternative. And this is something that we have to provide them to fight to overthrow capitalism and really pay homage, you know, to, to those heroes who tried in vain in the past. And, you know, we have this duty to carry this victory uh, to our, you know, our ourselves forward and forward to a conclusion because we have this duty now to build an international that truly defends Marxism and the ideas of, of, uh, of you know, of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky as this, this is literally the only way forward for our class. So yeah, leave it